Welcome to Gateway Sermons, and thank you for joining us as we venture together through God's Word. Our Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your grace, the mercy, O oh God, that you have poured out on us and continue to through Jesus Christ. God, we give you thanks. And thank you is such a weak phrase for this, for what you have done. And so, Father, I pray that you would be glorified as we try, Lord God, to honor the glory of your name as we sing and as we pray and as I preach and as we listen. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be honored and exalted and that how central you are, how ultimate you are, how high you are above everything would be clear in what we do this morning. And God, I pray that you would be with me as I speak and with us as we listen, Father. How I pray that you would help us listen. That we as a church would come to see this time as much a part of our worship as the singing, as anything else that happens. Father, listening to, considering your word, asking your Holy Spirit as we listen to bring these words to life inside of us. And so God, would you please be with me? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that what is done in this moment is done for the name of Jesus and not my own? And so Father, that you would speak through me to your people. And this I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's, um, it's interesting. One of the, <clears throat> if, if your goal is to preach the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, the message of the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the exaltation of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the salvation of sinners, if you concentrate on that, if you focus on that all the time, if you, if, if you believe that the central message of the Bible is Jesus Christ uh, as King, as Savior reigning, um, and you see in or you want to see in every text how it relates to Christ, um, that will cause tension. We know that. We've experienced that. We still experience it in many ways. And one of the ways it causes tension is people tend to want you to be more specific. Sometimes. You know, so I understand the gospel part of it. I get the gospel part of it. But now what do I do? What do I do? That's the big question usually. And I, and I, I do understand that. I do. And there are things to be done. We don't deny that in any way, shape, or form. But I would start off this message this morning with a word of caution to you. And I mean this with all of my heart. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be coy. Be careful what you wish for when it comes to Jesus. Be careful what you wish for. When Jesus starts getting specific, and he does, if we're listening, if we're listening to Jesus as this person that has ultimate authority over our lives, can rule and reign every aspect, and he means to, and he will, you have to ask yourself, if you're letting yourself be honest with scripture, what is the rationale for some of these commands? How in the world does Jesus expect us to obey some of these commands? We tend to create our own kind of Christianity in some ways, our own way of honoring God. We, we create these little rules and these guidelines that we live by um, that we can achieve, that we can meet and, and we sanctify those things. We try to make those things holy so that we can say to ourselves, I am living the Christian life. I am doing what I'm commanded to do. But then you read texts like we have this morning and we have to ask ourselves, am I listening to Jesus? What is the rationale for these commands? How in the world could he demand this of me? Jesus began to teach his disciples precisely what it would look like to be his new people, to be these new wineskins. And it's centered on God's mercy. And so we're going to look this morning at this passage, verse 17 through 36 of chapter 6 in four different sections. And instead of saving all the 
fill in the blank points or application points for the end. We're going to look at them as we go through and then we'll summarize at the end with what I think is the big major main command of this passage and why. So let's begin looking at this passage with the poverty of the blessed. The poverty of the blessed in verse 17. After coming down with them, his 12, he stood on a level place. God in human flesh on a level place with us. With a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases and those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. Then looking up at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor because the kingdom of God is yours right now. Blessed are you who are now hungry because you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now because you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. Now, Jesus places all humanity in this passage into two groups, into two groups of people, the blessed and the cursed, the woed, which we're going to see in the next part of the passage. He levels humanity out to teach them in verse 17. He says four times that a certain kind of people are blessed. Note the verbs in this passage. Verbs are everything in this passage. Note the tenses of the verbs. Blessed are. A certain kind of people are blessed right now. And when you read how Jesus describes those who are blessed, he reveals that being blessed by God will not necessarily, in fact, very rarely, will be shown by what they have, doesn't he? Right away. Whether or not someone is blessed by God cannot be measured materially. Jesus says that God considers a person blessed based primarily on where their satisfaction is coming from, the earth or the Father, from heaven. And notice these are not ethical instructions. Luke doesn't call this the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't take as long with it as Matthew does for their different reasons. But these are not commands in the beginning. It's not try to make yourself poor, try to make yourself hungry. These are not instructions. These are statements of fact, of being. These are statements of identity. Jesus is not commanding us to do anything here. He's describing a certain kind of people. The poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the persecuted are all blessed right now. Now, if we take those words seriously, we know Jesus doesn't play around. We have to understand that the poor, the hungry, the weeping, the persecuted, he's not, he's, he's, he's going deeper than money. He's going deeper than food. He's going deeper than emotions. He's going deeper than status. Jesus sees human beings in their relation to God completely sees them spiritually. So blessed are those who have nothing to give to God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Matthew says. Those who are broken inside before him. They're not trying to give God anything. They're blessed right now. The kingdom of God belongs to such people in this moment, whether or not they're wealthy. Blessed are those who are starving for God. They're starving for peace. They hunger for righteousness. They're hungry. They're starving to be whole, to be freed from sin. God will be their satisfaction. It's a promise. Blessed are those broken by the world. Blessed are those who can't find a home here. Blessed are those who feel the desire for more, for healing. God will be their joy. And isn't it funny if it wasn't so tragic? That we tend to measure, we count the broken person who is weeping and who can't seem to get to that place of just 
joy all the time. We count them at a disadvantage, don't they? Don't, don't we? we? We chide them. We tell them, you're supposed to be happy. Christians are supposed to be happy. I would agree with that statement. But a lot of us just aren't happy. For any number of reasons. And Jesus calls the one who can't seem to stop weeping, he calls them blessed. Blessed. We're all trying to paint on this fake face, but it's hard to walk around all chipper when following Jesus for real, which is what these texts mean, is breaking you. What Jesus commands us to do is not easy or natural to do. And so when we genuinely are trying, for lack of a better word, to follow Jesus, it's going to hurt. It's going to cost. You're going to have to ask yourself how some people never seem to be broken instead of asking all the time, why isn't everybody happy and smiling? That's not normal in the world that's broken. Jesus was a man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief. That's how he was described. He was friends with it. And blessed are those whom the world excludes and insults and slanders as evil because of their affection for Jesus. Not because they're jerks, but because of their affection for Jesus. That's the reason they're slandered. That's the reason they're insulted. That's the reason they're excluded. So sure is their reward in heaven that they can rejoice even now. In fact, they should leap for joy as they are getting persecuted, while they are getting slandered. While they are being insulted and excluded and marginalized, Jesus says, leap for joy. That's how sure their reward is with the Father in heaven. That's how sure the future is for them. That's how deeply the future affects the present of the one who follows Jesus. And Jesus says, we're in good company when we suffer for believing that you actually are blessed in these things. We're blessed for believing such crazy things could be true. We're in very good company. It's the ancestors of a different group of people. Jesus is saying in 23 that have always persecuted people who long for a lasting city that is yet to come. Jesus says to take heart that we don't measure whether or not God is blessing us by how much money we have or ease we have or health we have or comfort we have. And everything it seems like in the evangelical air is telling you that you don't know whether or not you're blessed until you have all those things, until you're wealthy, until you're secure, until your mood is always good, until everything is going your way. Then you know that you're blessed. And Jesus says clear as day exactly the opposite. So in your notes, under that first point about the poverty of the blessed, we are blessed even if we lack all earthly comforts because we belong to God. We have to to take what Jesus is saying and consider all that it might mean for us that poor, hungry, weeping, hated, excluded, reviled, spurned, and yet blessed. And secondly, that the poverty of the blessed is temporary. It will not last. That brokenness will not last. Which brings us to the wealth of the cursed in verses 24 to 26. But woe to you who are rich. Again, notice the verbs. For you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are now full, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are now laughing, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. Isn't that the goal? Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the false prophets. Now again, notice what Jesus is doing. He's posing two kinds of people as exact opposites. That's why he uses pairs. That's why you have four blessed and four woes or cursed, we, we, we could say. That's, 
what we're saying. Hebrew is emphasizes by repetition. You get to three, like holy, holy, holy. We're talking about infinite holiness. You get to four woes. Woe, woe, woe is as bad as you can get. And then you get a fourth. Notice the difference between the present state of the people in the second set that we're looking at now and how there is nothing for them in the future. Nothing. All that they will get, they have now. And they're cursed. Woe to you who are rich right now. Now, we can do one of two things right here. We can just kind of gloss over it or we can let it get in and sit down. And I think the verbs of Jesus are telling us we have to listen. And I know this is a hard word. I know for unique reasons it's a hard word if you're literally poor, and for unique reasons it's a hard word if you are literally rich, and we have both in abundance in our church. So this is a hard word that just is. Woe to you who are rich right now. Whatever your money gets you now, if that's what your hope is in, and we would all say if we're wealthy, my hope isn't in my money, okay. Whatever your money gets you now is all the comfort you will ever have. Woe to you who are full right now. Whatever fills your belly today is going to run out. Woe to you who laugh right now. The happiness that you have today will turn to mold in your mouth eventually. And woe to you. It is a curse to you when everybody speaks well of you. Why are we always trying to make everybody think we're great? At the individual level, the family level, the relational level, the church level, the town level, we're, every, everybody has to think we're great. Why? Why? Woe to you when everybody speaks well of you right now. That's how the ancestors of such people used to treat the false prophets. Such people have always flattered and built up people that didn't confront them or condemn them. They've always thought highly of people like that and held them up and praised them. It's what false prophets did. They lied about what God had said. They wanted the people to like them, so they changed their messages and they lied about what they had heard from the Lord because most of them had heard nothing from Him at all. They've always flattered such people. Now, Notice how the contrast is being drawn. Again, that's very important here from a literature, literary perspective. Notice how Jesus is drawing that contrast. Four sets in each one, and they follow the exact same pattern, right? Poor, rich, exact opposites, hungry, full, laughing, weeping, maligned, praised. To have all your security, all your hope planted in this world, and what you can get from it is a cause for woe. And at the very least, in this text, what we have to be willing to understand is that it is not in any way, shape, or form under this new covenant, this new program from God that has come in Jesus Christ, it is not an automatic sign of blessing from God in any way, shape, or form to be wealthy, to be successful, to have what you want, to not struggle, to enjoy a good reputation. That is not in any way for us to automatically say, I am being blessed by God, not according to Jesus. Not now that Jesus has came, you can't use that as a barometer for whether or not you're blessed at all. In fact, what it should be right away is a barometer that maybe you're not. Now that's heavy. Again, you, you, I, I know I've said this quote before. That I heard a pastor say one time, I don't know what sentimental thoughts you have about Jesus, but read the Bible and they'll go away. So maybe if, depending on where we are in this passage, what would it mean for you to take Jesus seriously this morning? If any of the R's in any of these things are where you are. How did we ever get there? How did we ever get to the place that we know when one is blessed by God based on their material or social status? 
How did that ever come to be? Bad preaching. We're not Israel. Our covenant isn't landlocked. And it isn't promised material blessings. In fact, it's all flipped on its head. Those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's a promise under the old covenant. Jesus was poor. Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. So, so how? Paul lost everything. Peter, James, didn't we just see them? Isn't it interesting that this passage follows a text in which four men, the text says specifically, left everything and followed him. They left their jobs. They left their businesses. And we can say, well, in a, you know, a, a first century Palestinian economy, it would have been much easier to walk away. No, no. It's never been easy to leave your source of income. Ever. And again, the point in that is not that God is telling each one of you to leave your job. That's not the point at all. The point is Jesus was worth it. That was the point. But how, how did we ever get there? I, I, do we just flat out ignore him? Do we just flat out ignore him? We make the, the goal of the Christian life for everybody to be healthy and wealthy and successful and I mean, Jesus is just so stinking clear, it's maddening. Christians push other Christians to succeed. To be victorious, that's my favorite. You're victorious now, regardless. That comes from Jesus, not your attitude. To declare how wonderful we all are, that's how we define blessing. We let what the world values tell us whether or not we're blessed. And we measure each other. We see people struggling financially or in their relationships. Maybe it's always a mess. Maybe it's always trouble. And we just think, man, they need to get their lives together. I'm, I, you know, I, I, they, they want to be blessed. They want to be, maybe they already are. Maybe because what Jesus did at the cross is so big, he doesn't measure people like we tend to. Jesus says there are two kinds of people in the world. He says it flat out. And the blessed ones now look way different than the cursed ones do right now. Way different, generally speaking. So in your notes, we are cursed even if we have it all but don't belong to God. Rich, full, happy, praised, and cursed. And beloved, the wealth of the cursed is fleeting. It's so temporary. It's fleeting. And so we want to start to realize as we head into the next section now what these contrasts or what this contrast is doing for us. It, Jesus is begging the question right here. For one thing, where is all the persecution of the blessed? Because it sounds like your life is going to be pretty hard if you're blessed. Where is all that difficulty coming from? Why is it so difficult for the blessed now? Who is making their lives on earth so hard? That second set of people. The cursed. The ones on whom God has pronounced woe. They are the ones persecuting the blessed. Which is why Jesus turns to give ethical instruction to his people now. And the teaching, and we have to let it get in. The teaching here, there is no other way to say it, is flat out shocking. It's just shocking. The ethics of the persecuted in verses 27 to 34. But I say to you who listen. Now notice that. Jesus has made a distinction by now, hasn't he? Notice verse 20 and verse 27 together. Who is still listening? Who would still be listening? These are instructions for the blessed in light of how they are being treated by the cursed. But I say to you who listen. Now, most of us in here know these, but are you ready? Love your enemies. <laughs> Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now that should come like electric shock 
to God's people. There goes any claim I have on myself. It's gone. Self-preservation is gone. It is not a Christian ethic. It's gone. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. That's my favorite. That's sarcasm. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you, really, Jesus? I'm poor. Remember? Blessed are the poor. I, I, I only have one coat and one shirt. Give to everyone who asks you and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. We've made the golden rule so casual, we don't even understand what it's really commanding. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Do you hear what Jesus is doing? Do you hear what he's saying with the word credit and the word blessing in the same text? He's asking, how are you blessed by that type of approach to behavior? Loving only those who love you. What, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? You hear him. Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. Now the reason that sounds repetitive is because it is. Jesus is using parallels. He's a Jewish teacher. And in their literature and their teaching, they would use parallels to embellish a point, to just beat the dead horse, to draw it out, make it bigger so that it would be crystal clear. And here we have that. We have four blessed, we have four woes, and then there are four commands in verses 27 and 28. Then the rest of that passage, he is widening them broadening the application of those commands to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Here's why, really, at the end of the day, it's so shocking. It is one thing to be blessed right now for being persecuted. That's hard enough to believe. It's another thing entirely to be commanded to then turn around and love the people that are persecuting you. When they punch you, let them punch you again. When they take from you, give them more. Whatever they ask for, give it to them. If they take something, don't demand it back. Treat other people like I want to be treated. Listen, that's not just a nice little rule for good boys and girls. All right, that is insane. Treat others as you want them to treat you, which means, how do I want to be treated? Okay, so I'm going to have to treat everybody with the utmost respect. I'm going to treat everybody with complete, unconditional love. No questions asked. No challenges. Complete trust. No criticism. No burdens. Constant praise. Constant affirmation. That's how we all want to be treated, whether we will own up to it or not. And Jesus says, yep, treat other people that way. Jesus, that is not how this world works. I mean, can you, do you feel that? Right now our minds are running through situations and people that we're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that for them. <laughs> right? Jesus doesn't know what they've done to me. Yes, he does. You say, that would affect every relationship in my life. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And you thought Jesus came so that we would just have a quiet time and not cuss. We thought Jesus was the key to getting everything the cursed people have in verses 24 to 26. Three times in this text, Jesus asks the question, what credit is that to you? Let, let, let's hear that again from our Lord in verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? 
Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. Jesus is asking, how will you be blessed by behaving like everyone else whose hope is not in heaven when you are treated poorly? There's a way the world reacts to not being loved in return. There's a way the world reacts to when you borrow, not getting it back. There, there's a standard way of responding to everything that is done to us. And Jesus is saying, if you live like that, how are you any different from the world? And he, he, again, these aren't like specifics, like when this happens, that happens. This just comes in and takes over your whole heart and says, I own all of it. I own every interaction, every relationship, everything. It's mine. And this is how you behave. See, he just, he just, that's why he goes general. So that when you think, does it mean this situation? The answer is always, yep, that one. Especially that one, probably. How am I going to have anything? Yeah. Right. Blessed are you who are poor. What will it gain you to live the normal way? To value those things, to live on those responses what credit is that to you? That's how the woad act in verses 24 to 26. This is the principle those who have no hope fixed in eternity live their lives by. But this is not how the blessed live. That's what Jesus is describing, how the blessed live. They don't angle their relationships to get anything from people. They don't love only if they're going to get loved in return. They don't live their lives as so many of us do saying, well, I'm never doing anything nice for that person again. I tried to be nice, I gave to them, and look how they repaid me. Oh my God, beloved. We need Jesus. We don't do good only to those that want, we want something in return from. We don't lend only when we know we'll get paid back. That's how you live when there's nothing in the world or when there's nothing in eternity you're waiting to take hold of, to finally be satisfied. That's how you live. That's how you respond in everyday life, in those everyday relationships and situations when you have zero hope in heaven and all your hope in this world. And in this relationship working and that job working and this person treating you like you wanted, that's how you live when you have no hope in the future. You have to get it now from that person. You have to get it now in that conversation. It goes that micro, right? I have to have it now. That's how the woad live, which is why they seem to have so much. Or at least that group can be described that way. These three questions, questions match right up with the command from Jesus to love, do good, and lend, right? This is Jesus getting specific on just precisely what it looks like to truly obey those commands. Because we're God's people who are blessed immeasurably now from him and need the world to give us nothing, literally nothing. Because of that, we love our enemies. We do good to those who hate us. We bless those who curse us. We pray for those who mistreat us. We lend, that is, expecting nothing in return. So we give them all that we can, including our right to speak to our Father on their behalf, whether or not that ever pays off in this life. Loving them sets it all up. When you love with the love of Christ, what do you do? You do good, you bless, you pray, you lend, in particular to your enemies, to those who are making your life so hard. It's, you, you can't get away from him. You, you just can't. We are commanded to love our enemies in your notes. We are commanded to love our enemies with a love that gives all and requires nothing in return. That's the command. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Lend expecting nothing in return. So the ethics of the persecuted are shocking. That's shocking behavior. Be quickly as I can try to illustrate the insanity of what Jesus is commanding here as we head into the last point. 
and this is going to rub, okay? And there's a part of me that wants it to rub because I think that helps bring the point home, and then there's a part of me that doesn't want it to rub because I don't know how mad it's going to make some of you. It's never a goal, by the way, in preaching. It's not smart. Tick off your audience. Not a good idea, okay? So just work with me for a minute, all right? Let's consider, let's take all of our personal stuff, set it over here for just a few minutes, and consider the flat-out blatant words of Jesus, okay? In 2012, there was a baker, owned a bakery in Colorado, who refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding reception. A, a gay couple, two men, came into a shop with one of the guy's mom. They were going to have their wedding in Massachusetts, but they were going to have a reception with friends and family in Colorado. And so they asked the baker to bake them a cake for this reception. And the baker said, I'm a Christian. This is a Christian establishment. I refuse to bake a cake for uh, a gay wedding reception. Now, just so we're clear, I don't think the government has any business telling any business owner how they should exercise their religious beliefs, okay? I, in other words, I don't think the government has the right to come in there and force that man to bake that cake. Are we clear? Any more than I think uh, the government has the right to force a Muslim to eat pork, okay? So I, I don't believe that, I don't want the government involved in religion at all, zero. So just so we're clear, but How do the words of Jesus in this passage apply to that situation? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Now, I, hey, I can feel it. I can feel it. Tony, are you? Yeah. Bake the cake and then give it to him for free. Jesus Christ transcends the law. And you have to decide what ethics, what values are going to determine, to determine how you live your life. What was more important in that moment, him keeping his business or him spreading the gospel? And if you say, well, there, and I know what, I've heard all the arguments, then how do you explain the life of Jesus? Jesus didn't just go to a party where there was wine, he drank. We're not condoning their sin by baking the cake? We're not condoning their sin? Being commanded to live like this is shocking because that's where it's going to intersect our good old American values. That's where it's going to intersect it. How do I live the gospel in this moment? Is there anything more important in this moment than my rights? Always. There are always more important considerations than your rights in every situation, which is precisely what a text like this is telling us. So you can, you can send your emails, you can get ticked off, you just better come loaded with texts. Yeah, these are shocking ethics. Shocking ethics. All my rights are gone, is what Jesus is saying. So, hopefully, what's happening now is a huge burden that how in the world am I going to get specific about following Jesus? Because the most shocking thing in this text is not how we're commanded to live. What blows that out of the water is why. Let's look at the mercy of God in the last two verses, 35 and 36. But love your enemies. Do what is good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For... He is kind. He is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. That's why you bake the cake, just so you know. For he is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful. 
just as your Father also is merciful. The whole section flows into that one thought. Where did grace come from? You see it just, mercy just shows up out of nowhere in this passage. Out of nowhere. God is calling his people to do for others what he has done for us. So he's not calling us to something unfair, is he? No, he's calling us to give what we have received. So that's where verses 35 and 36 are where we begin to see how the gospel always brings us home. Always. The gospel is always the answer to the how should I, what should I question. Always. Jesus is not saying ignore sin. Jesus is not saying gloss over sin. Jesus is not saying that there aren't certain things that are going to happen, that relationships that no matter how much mercy you try to show, they're never going to be restored. Jesus is not saying that. Jesus is proclaiming the insanity of the fact that in the midst of all that, God has had mercy on me. That's, the, that's what drives the bus. Always. I can't let the cross leave my eyes or my soul because when I do, not only do I lose my only hope, I lose the whole rationale for following one single command from Jesus. If I lose the gospel, I lose the whole reason for doing anything. What's driving, what am I trying to save? What am I trying to keep? What do I have to have that the enemies of mine threaten to take away from me? Those are the places, those are the people where I go to give mercy, not to make demands. I don't make people conform to my Christianity. That's not what I do. That's an Islamic way of thinking, not a Christian way of thinking. Do you notice the connection in this text between the children of the Most High and the ancestors earlier in that passage? See what Jesus is doing. We we know what family, what set of people the curse belonged to by the fact that they do what their family on earth has always done. They persecute the children of God, here identified as the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the malign. They make their lives difficult. And they treat their spokesmen like garbage while praising and exalting only those who can benefit them. And by implication here, the woed people, the cursed people, they do the exact opposite in every single one of these commands that the people of Jesus are called to do. But the children of the Most High, they come from different ancestors. They come from a different lineage of people. They come from a family with the best big brother that ever lived. The one who touches lepers, parties with sinners, lets prostitutes wash his feet and doesn't care about how the Pharisees will gripe that you shouldn't get that close to dirtiness. They come from him who gives and gives and loves and loves and lends and lends when he knows full well nobody has the slightest ounce to pay him back with. We don't know whether or not we're going to pay back. Jesus knows every time he gives, no matter what he gives, you can't pay me back here. What's the ground of that three-part command in verse 35? Do you see the word for In the end of that verse, why am I called to such a shocking lifestyle of being kind to ungrateful and evil people? Why to the very people who are making my life so hard? Do you see what Jesus is saying? Why would I ever live that way? Because we are ungrateful and evil and God has been immeasurably kind to us. That's the why in all of it. We aren't trying to pay God back for his lavish grace by living the Christian life, beloved. That's not what we're doing. When we live like this, we're spending his money. Be merciful just as your father is also merciful. That's the whole text summarized. That's the why of the Christian life. Because God is merciful 
to me, and it never runs out. So, so you feel the weight of that. Feel the weight of it. Feel the utter impossibility that you're going to be able to do this. And run to Jesus with it. Because most of us aren't going to be able to get past my illustration earlier when we walk away. To look out at the world where we see everything we can't stand and everything we hate and wickedness and all these vessels of wrath just ripe for God's destruction. To look out at all of them and say, that's me? That's what he saw when he looked at me? And instead of crushing me and making me pay for everything I have ever done, he covered me with his mercy? You get there, and guess what? The Bible will be true. You won't need a written code to live by. You'll know what to do. Because Jesus has actually been very clear about how we treat others. Particularly our enemies. That's the foundation of all Christian ethics. Not effort, not law, but the gospel of God's mercy in Jesus Christ. That's why in Romans 12, when Paul gets done with all those, that indicative truth, the statement he makes is, therefore, I beseech you, I beg you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, not because of the mercies of God, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Because God has been merciful to you. And mercy is the only way you get to mercy. These commands here have no power to help you obey them. Zero. The only power there is to obey the commands of Jesus is in verse 35 and 36. That's where the power to obey the commands of Jesus comes from. The commands will kill you. You won't be able to stand up under their weight. But Jesus will make you new. So in your notes, we're commanded to show undeserved mercy to those who treat us badly because God has shown such mercy to us. So you don't go home today and try really hard to be a merciful person. You focus on the gospel, and the gospel makes you merciful. When I see a command to love my wife a certain way or you know, to treat a person a certain way, what do I do? I don't try to do it. I go to the gospel. And in the love of Christ for me, I understand how to love my wife. That's how the gospel becomes practical. You just start applying what's in it to every situation. How do I respond to this friend? How has God responded to me? We are commanded to show undeserved mercy to those who treat us badly because God has shown such mercy to us. And so the last point there in your notes is that the mercy of God towards us is more shocking than any command we've been given to show mercy to our enemies. These verses would be shocking if God had not saved us. To be merciful to people who don't deserve it. To be kind, even when there's more at play, is how God has treated me. We belong to him now, believers. He's met us on a level place. You know why we can live like this? Because we're blessed by God right now. That's how. This identity is a blessed identity. We are not being looked over. We are not being made to become victims, and that's the only hope that we have. This identity is blessed. And at some point, we have to realize we cannot hang on to two identities. One that is willing to trust God with the realities Jesus is proclaiming and commanding here, but then one that will not allow us to let go of our claim on ourselves. You can't do it. You can't live two identities. That's why I, I don't command you who are rich what to do with your money. You know, you'll know what to do with your money as God moves and works in your life the closer that you draw to him. I'm not worried about that. We don't need to control that. The key to submission to Jesus 
is the worship of Jesus for the mercy by which we've been accepted forever. So as God's people, our identity is blessed and we live it out by doing what isn't normal. Being merciful to those who don't deserve it. I'm going to close with a video this morning. I went longer than I wanted to as usual, but I think it's important. So I want to close with a video that will have the final word and then Victor will come and play and we'll take the Lord's Supper together. This table where we remember just what it is that we're talking about, what Jesus has done for us. So if you're a follower of Jesus in this room this morning, we encourage you, we invite you with us. There's a table in the back with bread in the cup. There's a table here. When the video's over and Victor begins to play, you can make two lines and you can take it there and, or take it back to your seat, either one. But, and then we'll take our offering and close. But I beg you to listen this morning, to take your hesitation and your anger and your frustration and your fear and let it run through Jesus. Okay, let's watch together. Are you merciful? Why? Because Jesus healed the sick. Because Jesus fed the multitudes. Because Jesus gave legs to the crippled. Because Jesus granted sight to the blind. Because Jesus opened the ears of the deaf. Because Jesus found prostitutes and tax collectors and threw them into the sphere of his love. Because Jesus touched the untouchable and loved the unlovable and forgave the unforgivable and welcomed the undesirable because Jesus even now saves the otherwise unsavable. Why? Because they deserve it. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done in righteousness, not because we met Him halfway, not because we took the proper steps forward and in good faith have elevated ourselves to the place of the deserving poor, but according to His mercy. We are here because Jesus Christ didn't say with cold indifference, give them what they deserve, they brought it on themselves. Jesus Christ is the mercy of God. And seeing us in our misery and need, He doesn't just feel for us. He takes the necessary action to relieve our distress. He leaves the eternal glory of heaven and the perfect fellowship of the Trinity. He condescends to us, lives among us, suffers like us, dies for us. Do you understand this? Have you experienced this? again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.